Today with Pastor Joseph Prince. I'm going to share with you today something that is very, very crucial. It's one of the, uh, I believe, it's going to be another landmark message in our series on answering doubts that people have about the gospel of grace. We intend to remove all the doubts, amen? We intend to remove all the doubts so that in your heart you have that settled security, amen? You have that emancipated heart, knowing that there's no more judgment in your future. Don't forget, He loves you more than you love yourself. So the topic I want to share today is repentance. Say repentance. Yes. Now I can preach it like this, okay? Repent! <laughs> okay? Or I can tell you, change your mind, all right? You used to think this way, now think this way, because the word repentance is so abused today that people say things like, all right, well, so-and-so doesn't preach repentance. Well, that preacher, you know, he doesn't preach repentance, as if they are an authority on repentance. And, and I just want to question their idea of repentance. What do they mean when they say repentance? All right, when they say repentance, many of them are referring to you got to be sin conscious. You got you to beat yourself over your sins. You got to be sin conscious. Now, nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to the gospel. The gospel says because of what Christ has done, we should have no more sin consciousness. Now, I'm going to show you one thing. Once upon a time, in the Old Testament, there are plenty of occasions to show you that you have to repent first before God blesses you. In the Old Testament, you have to repent, turn away from sin, and then God blesses you. Now listen, in the New Testament, God blesses you, and it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Now I've been using that verse all the time, but look up the verse, Romans 2 verse 4, or do you despise the riches of His goodness? How many know God is not just good, He is plenty of good. <laughs> the riches of His goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The word lead there is like the Holy Spirit leading you. The goodness of God leads you where? To repentance. It is not repentance. Listen, it is not repentance leads you to goodness. It is goodness that leads you to repentance. When someone says, you know, Pastor Prince, I'm concerned I've not repented enough. What do you mean you have not repented enough? All depends. Are you talking about repentance of the law or repentance of the gospel? There is a repentance of the gospel. Now, what is repentance of the law? Look up here, Mark chapter 1. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Notice, John, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, he came preaching what? A, repent, a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, John, under the law, he preached this sermon that you need to repent before you are forgiven. All right? And baptism there is uh, Jewish people. Even if you go to Israel today, you'll find a lot of uh, a mikveh. They call it uh, baptismal pools, which means uh, every time you come, you, you, you repent, you go into the baptismal pool. Amen. All right, there's a baptism of repentance yeah, under the law. And John was under the law. Okay? He preached a repentance for the remission of sins. Valid. Okay? And then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to John, and they were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So confessing sins is something that the Old Testament, they are aware of. It is taught in the Old Testament. Are you listening? All right? I want to prove to you that John was under the law. Okay? Uh, Luke 16, verse 16. The law, Jesus speaking here, the law and the prophets were until John. So, the law and the prophets, Jesus said, were until John. So John was preaching a repentance of the law. Since that time, since that time of John, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Just now I show you John's baptism, right? In Mark 1. Now go back to Mark 1. Look at Mark 1. Jesus now came. Now after John was put in prison, all right, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, Jesus' message is different from John. After John's ministry ended, and, and, and incident, incidentally, John was the last of all the prophets of the law, Jesus came preaching the good news. So he came preaching, saying, repent. Now, when Jesus uses repent, now, church, the New Testament repentance, repentance of the gospel is actually changing your mind about your self-righteousness. It is giving up all pretensions to righteousness. 
All right, it's important you understand this. Now, when, jo when, when uh, Philip preached in the city of Samaria, what did he preach? Did he preach repentance? No, he preached Christ. And the whole city responded. You can say the whole city repented. Amen. In the New Testament, how do you bring people to a place of changing their minds? You preach Christ. Don't keep on harping to your colleague, hey, you are a repenter. You better, you better repent. You better repent. You know, it sounds so religious now. Amen. The Bible talks about repentance towards God. You know, Paul's ministry, Acts 20, verse 21. Paul's ministry is this. Paul is talking here, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, repentance towards God. Towards is eyes in, in Greek. It's towards God. In other words, change your mind towards God. Change your mind concerning God. Amen. You used to think that God is out to get you. Now you know God loves you in your lost, guilty condition. Amen. Change your mind. Well, Pastor Prince, I believe that repentance, the change of mind that you talk about. Now, this I, I, is actually in some of the statements of... Uh, some great theologian, okay? And, and they, are, they, are, they are good theologians, they are great theologians. But sometimes I think that we are adding to God's word. When God's word says change of mind, we try to say, it's not just change of mind, it is this sorrow, this contrition, this remorse. How about the word remorse? You gotta have remorse for what you have done. There are people who have a lot of remorse, nothing changes. I wanna prove to you, remorse is not repentance. All right. Look at Judas, okay, Matthew 27. I'm going to show you from the King James Version first. Then Judas, which had betrayed Jesus when he saw that he was condemned. Now, who condemned him? Not the Pharisees. He realized he stands in the condemnation of God. All right? Repented himself. Say that. Repented himself. And brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Sounds like repentance and restitution. He brought back the 30 pieces of silver, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. What an awesome thing. God makes the one who betrayed him testify that he's innocent. And they said, what is that to us? Sit down to that. And he cuts down the piece of silver in the temple and departed and went, went and hanged himself. Now, this word repentance, repent, it is not the word metanoia. All right? You want to see your King James, your new King James, excuse me, for that verse. Seeing that he had been condemned, he was remorseful. If only he had waited for a few more hours, Jesus would hang for him. He didn't have to hang for himself. Notice why it's not metanoia, because New Testament repentance is giving up all pretensions to righteousness. When he went and hanged himself, he was saying, I'll pay the price for my sin. And God hates that, even when you kill yourself. Because God has provided Jesus Christ, and his hanging on the cross is supposed to be your hanging and my hanging. Amen. So it, it humbles the, the, the human heart, amen, it humbles us when we say, Lord, I cannot even punish myself because you were punished for me. It would be wrong for you to hurt yourself. Mm, it's self-righteousness. You need to repent of that because it's a, it's a pretension to righteousness. You know, when you hurt yourself, you feel better. That's a form of self-righteousness. How dare you hurt yourself? When Jesus took that hurt and that pain and that beating upon himself for that sin that you're chiding yourself over. He paid for it. And the most humble thing, the most God-given response that you can rest, come, come up with is this, thank you, Father, for the gift of your son. Thank you, Jesus, for taking all the punishment and the beating. Amen? Not too long ago, this year, I asked the Lord, Lord, give me some more. I need to show people that just because someone says repentance doesn't mean repentance is produced. It's not preaching Christ and the finished work. And sometimes you preach Christ and the finished work and the goodness of God, repentance is produced. So God, I need, I need more than these verses that you've given me. All these verses God gave me in times past. But I said, give me, 
you know, some fresh wood. If, this year, ask the Lord, and this year he gave me. So what you're gonna hear at the end is actually from the Lord only recently. Never heard anyone preach this, never read it from a book. It came pr straight from the Lord. So here's from heaven for you. All right, repentance. From the mouth of Jesus himself. In the most well-known parables of Jesus, what is it? The prodigal son. All right, but let's look at the context of the story. Before we talk about prodigal son, Luke 15. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. All right, all the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, tax collectors back then were not people of integrity. They tax more than they should. Okay, they, they, they actually are doing it for another country, another nation actually, for the Romans. Amen. And they, they would, uh, remember, remember that Zacchaeus was one of them? They were people of devious means, all right? They were people uh, 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 who were very rich, wealthy, but they were very cunning, all right? And they were deceitful. Even Zacchaeus said, all right, uh, whoever I've stolen from, right? So they were thieves even. Now, sinners and tax collectors drew near to Jesus. There's something about Jesus that when you, it's not like the Jesus some people preach today. This Jesus drew the sinners to him. Okay, the Pharisees and scribes complained saying this man received sinners. So he spoke this parable to them. Don't forget, this parable is shared with the Pharisees in the hearing of the sinners. Okay, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. Next. And when he has found it, he lays the sheep on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. When God gave this to me, and the Lord said this to me, when He gave this to me, I've read this so many times. I've preached on the prodigal son, how, you know, all these past years, isn't it, to all of you? Have you heard me preach on that? And I never saw this, and the Lord said this to me, son, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. But the illustration is the sheep that was lost. And then the Lord asked me, what did the sheep do? How did the sheep repent? Because the illustration is about one sinner that repents, you know, and he talked about one sheep that got lost. Do we see the sheep saying, God, I'm here, I come back to you. You're miserable, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you're lonely, you feel wretched, you feel lost in the wilderness. Then along comes the shepherd and he picks you up. The only repentance I see is this. The sheep must consent to be loved. The sheep must consent to be carried. And then he puts the sheep on his shoulders. The sheep must consent to rest on the strength of the Lord. But if the hero of this story is not the lost sheep, it is the shepherd that went to find, the shepherd found, the shepherd took, the shepherd laid on his shoulder, the shepherd went back, the shepherd says, rejoice with me. Who throws a party over one sheep that's lost? The Lord does. Amen. Tell me, those who fight for repentance the way they, tell me how did the sheep repent? Oh, the sheep must have said, <laughs> no, you're arguing from silence. I'm showing you what's in the scriptures. <laughs> Let's go on to the next parable. Next one. Uh, what woman having, before that, let me go back to the verse seven, all right? He says, I say to you, likewise, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Do, do you really think there are 99 just persons who need no repentance? You know, the Bible says he left the 99 sheep and look for the one that's lost. Don't forget who was he talking to? He was talking to the Pharisees. Who was listening? The sinners, okay? Do you think for one moment the 99 are righteous? Like he says, 99 just persons who need no repentance? It's tongue in cheek. There's no such thing as a just person who need no repentance. The Pharisees need repentance just as much. But he's just telling them, all right, the sheep knows it's lost. All right, it consents to be safe. You don't. 
You don't give up your pretensions to righteousness. There's no, no joy in heaven over you. There's joy in heaven over this one. Don't forget the context. And then the lost coin, because of time. All right, the woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. What do you find in a coin? Image. We were all made in the image of God. And a long time ago, Adam fell, all right, and lost that image. Now Jesus came to restore the image. When she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In other words, the coin that was found is the coin that repents. Question. <laughs> I think you all know what I'm gonna say before I say it already. All right, you're intelligent in my new creation church. You all learn very fast. How did the coin repent? Okay, because of time, we're gonna finish the prodigal son story. And he finished the entire thing, dropped down. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, all right? You know the story, the younger one uh, came to him, his father gave me my share of the inheritance and the father divided both of them, the inheritance. He went to a far country, spent his money with rioters living and with prostitutes and all that. And all his friends ran out when his money ran out and he had no money, he was hungry, he went to work and, and the only job he found uh, was in feeding the pigs. Now for a Jew, pigs and Jews are not kosher. All right, he was in the pits. And then he looked at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the food of the pig. Let's follow the story, all right? He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pots that swine ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, some people said, hey, that's repentance, Pastor Prince. Okay, let's look at his repentance, okay? How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. It sounds like repentance. So far, so good, right? And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So far, so good. So good, right? Make me one of your hired servants. Now, this is no good. Why does he want to be one of the hired servants? Because he just said what? How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? His thoughts were all about himself. It's not because he missed his father. It is not because he saw the error of his ways. It's because he was hungry. So I will call this, all right? Yes, I will grant it is a form of repentance, but I will call this imperfect repentance. Will God still accept it? Let's go down. Verse 20, he arose by, make me one of your hired servants, means he wants to qualify, he wants to earn, he wants to merit the blessings of the father, all right? He arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, look at these five things, number of grace. His father saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have, he went through his rehearsed speech, okay? Father, notice the father's response, okay? The father saw him before he repented, right? The father had compassion before he repented, before he uttered his repentance. And the father ran, the father fell on his neck, the father kissed him before he confessed his sin, right? Talk to me, people, yes. right? Before he confessed his sin. So he went through his rehearsal speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now go back to verse uh, 20, uh, verse 19. Go back, all right? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Actually, that statement, make me like one of your hired servants. Notice he did not say that. Go back to, drop down again. He only managed to say, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, you know what happened? Why he didn't say, make me one of your hired servants? When you see the father running to you, when you see the father hugging you, kissing you all over when you smell like pigs, the only thing you can say, Father, I have sinned. This time, it's really repentance. How can you say, let me, make me earn when the Father has given. How can you say, it's not in place to say, make me one of your hired servants in the presence of such abundance of grace. <laughs> this time, the Father's goodness and grace shut his mouth from saying, make me one of your hired servants. He never got through that part. There was true repentance, but which one came first? His motive for coming back was imperfect. All right? But when the father lavished the love, the love came first, the goodness came first, then the confession, Father, I have sinned. 
This time the confession is real. Look at what the father said next. The father says, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here, kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead, he's alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Let me just tell you this. It's almost as if the father didn't care what he said. The father kept on doing whatever he wants to do. It, it is just that God wants to pour out his heart on us. And we think that God is, God is impressed with our words, our performance. You are not the hero. With, you know, this is not the prodigal son, actually. It's actually the generous father. Some people call it prodigal father. The hero of the story is the father. And yet, our emphasis is on man's repentance. No, it was the father's love that produced genuine repentance in the son. All right? And if I have time, I'll tell you about the older brother. He was not far from home, but he was a hard worker. He wasn't at home, by the way. You know why? He's a hard worker. He was in the field working but it was not close to the father. He needed repentance as well. And don't forget the story is about what? The Pharisees. They were the older brothers. The sinners were the younger brother. Amen? And the, father, and the, and the older brother said what? All these years I slaved for you and I kept your commandments. I never broke any of your commandments. You never gave me. You see, his mentality of the father, his thoughts towards his father, he needed repentance towards the father. He need to change his mind towards the Father. The Father is a, such a generous man, such a loving man, and yet he never saw it, and he was always in the field. He says, you never gave me a kid that I might celebrate with my friends, not with, with you, my Father. He had no love for his Father. So the Pharisees, boasting in their self-righteousness, needed repentance as much. So church, I hope that you have received the essence of what I'm trying to share here, and let's give Jesus the praise and the glory, amen. Amen. It's time to repent right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Church, without even, sometimes without even having to say, change your mind about God. Many of times, if the preaching is under the anointing, there's already God is giving people changing of minds unto life. Amen. From darkness to light, from depression to peace, from sickness to health, from weariness to rest. God gives you repentance, change of mind. And that's the reason we come to church, because constant repentance is going on. And every time we, we give up an erroneous belief, we give up our pain. Every time we give up an erroneous belief, we give up our, our little insanity. Every time we give up our erroneous belief, we give up a part of our life that has been hurting us. We give up our torment. Erroneous belief is dangerous, so dangerous that your whole life is governed by what you believe. It's important when you come to church, repentance goes on, which means changing of mind. You start to believe what the Word of God declares. And church, He loves you. He loves you. He's your Father, and He wants you to know that you don't have to resort to your own means to provide for yourself. He's a Father who watches over you. He cares for the lily of the valley. He cares for every sparrow that falls. How much more will He care for you? And for those of you who are here, you say, Pastor Prince, I've never received Jesus as my Savior. I invite you today now that you've heard the truth, the wonderful God who seeks out the lost, who runs to the lost, would you be safe? Would you consent to be safe? Would you consent to be loved? Would you consent to rest on His strong, strong shoulders? If that is you, wherever you are, pray this prayer with me right now from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe you love me. I believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross for me. And on that cross, He who knew no sin became my sin. That I, who know no righteousness, have received the gift of righteousness. You raised Jesus from the dead as a proclamation 
that all my sins are effectually put away. Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father. All my sins, totally forgiven. My life has become abundant. My joy, unspeakable. My peace passes human understanding. Thank you, Father, for loving me. In Jesus' name, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. My friend, I trust you've been blessed by the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have experienced a breakthrough in your life through this ministry, we'd love to hear about it and rejoice with you. Please write in and share your praise report with me. I also want to encourage you to keep on tuning in to the preaching of the Gospel. I pray that you'll continue to see more of our wonderful Saviour and learn all about what He's done for you. God bless.